Okay, that was really nice. Am I all appropriately mic'd? Is that working? Okay, good. So you might notice I am a little bit on the tall side. Oh, I did play basketball. I tell people I'm 5'13". Um, <clears throat> sometimes if I'm giving a talk and people just keep looking at me, they say, how tall are you anyway? And <laughs> so um, I have three boys. My husband and I are both at UNC now. We met at Duke. Um, and as you heard, I played um, basketball. That was before anybody really cared about women's basketball, but uh, it's kind of fun to put it on my CV. But my, our three boys are diehard Tar Heel fans. And so that means they're not all that fond of Duke. Um, so they just say that I played for the ACC. That's their <laughs> way. Go with that, so. <clears throat> so thanks for having me. Uh, are, how many of you have been to these talks before? I hear there are a number of regulars. Great. So did I like this to be interactive. If we get too carried away on a different topic, I might bring us back again. But um, anybody come with a real specific thing you wanted to hear about? or? learn or that you were curious about or anything that you're brave enough to, you want to know if butter is better than margarine or <laughs> <laughs> that's one of the common questions. Yes. I have two mics. So I this one? Okay. That one? Tell me if it strays the wrong way. Okay. So, um, yes. Wow, that's, I could spend a couple hours on that. <laughs> but that's really, do you work in the area of I any sort? Okay, great. Well, there are a lot of logistics for sure, and we're still learning a lot on that. So, um, oh, you know, now these days they make us disclose things all the time, any kind of possible conflict of interest. And usually it's like some connection with the drug company or that kind of thing. That's not the case with me. <laughs> uh, instead, it's my little Good Bulls company. So I do actually have a company now. It's a for-profit company that, that allows me to get grants from NIH and other places, one reason for that. Um, but I do disclose the fact that I um, own this company. So far, I've invested a lot more money into it than has come out of it. <laughs> that may remain the case, but uh, we still have to uh, let people know. So the problem that I'm trying to address here. Uh, one is lack of access to healthy, affordable food. I'm sure you've heard about food deserts, a lot of concern that we have about um, all the rising rates of chronic disease associated with nutrition, yet a lot of people don't really have good access to healthy food. And then another side of that is rural poverty and what's going on with farmers. Ever since North Carolina um, kind of is transitioning away from tobacco, there used to be federal subsidies for tobacco and it, that's no longer the case. So farmers really do have to find another um, uh, crop to, to, um, to grow and to market. So they need help in finding markets and things. And then food waste. You're probably, you probably heard that like up to 40% of our food is wasted. So, so I'm trying to find the sweet spot between all three of those, which is a, a big undertaking, but um, it's fun to think about it. So this, you've probably heard of lots of different kinds of pyramids. This is the food, the health impact pyramid, and the, the former director of CDC came up with this approach. So you see, let's see, do I have a pointer? Yeah. So this is where we tend to spend most of our time in counseling and education, but as you can see, it's got less impact and more effort needed to put into it. So if we could move closer down here where we're changing the environment and changing some of the factors <clears throat> uh, what we call the social determinants of health, things like poverty and lack of food access and those kind of things that really have a big impact on what uh, people's health is. So that's where I've been trying to aim my efforts. So just a few updates on this. So in terms of food insecurity, which is kind of the word we're using these days for hunger, because it's not always frank hunger, it's often just not knowing whether you're gonna be able to get a reasonable meal in the near future. And so North Carolina doesn't fare too well in that regard in terms of uh, high amounts of food insecurity, um, including with children. And then in terms of the, uh, I mentioned the tobacco transition, and then as I'm sure you've followed, in recent years, the, a lot of our farms down east have had really devastating impact from the hurricanes. So, and then all that's going on with tariffs, and there's just many, many things that are making it hard for farmers. Um, 
And then I mentioned the 40% food waste. Uh, one thing, I don't know if you can read this, but people are getting interested in um, food that you might call grade B or uglies or misfits. My favorite name is cosmetically challenged. <laughs> so, so this is food that um, it was perfectly fine, but it doesn't look as nice, and so it's hard. It, it, you'd be surprised how tight the kind of uh, ways that, that grocery stores use in terms of um, limiting the types of food. Like, they won't take sweet potatoes beyond a certain size. Like, this morning I was roasting some vegetables, and I pulled out something I'd gotten at the farmer's market. It was a sweet potato almost the size of a football, and it was perfect. It was, it was a little hard to cut. <laughs> but. You would never see that in the grocery store because who would want to buy a football size sweet potato? So those kind of things usually go to waste. But there has been some effort like selling these, the, the misfits. And then as you'll see with our um, Good Bowls product, it's not a problem at all. We can just chop it up and use it. No one would ever know that it was every, ever um, ugly. So this notion of social entrepreneurship <coughs> I teach a course in public health entrepreneurship, which is a part of this, and the students come up with really interesting ideas of how they're going to solve a public health problem in a way that's more sustainable. So you usually address a social problem. You may have heard on the radio things like the School Foundation and Ashoka. Those are some organizations that really kind of focus on this. In the world of um, academia, we spend a lot of time writing grants, and um, when you're in the area, I am like trying to impact health when the grant is over, the project often goes away, and so you don't have lasting impact. So that's a big frustration for people doing intervention kind of research of how to make it stick or how to make it last. So that's one reason to think about an entrepreneurial approach, that if it can be something that can sustain itself, then it's got a better chance of doing that. So this is going to be a lot of things on one slide. but. So we've got two things going here that kind of led to us developing this good bowls idea. So we talked some about food insecurity and the high prevalence in North Carolina. We talked about food deserts, which you probably know are where there's not a good grocery store. Food swamps are kind of the opposite, where there's too much in the way of fast food and that sort of thing. And they tend to go together, unfortunately. So you've got a desert and a swamp kind of in the same community. Um, Corner or convenience stores are one option in some of these areas, but they tend to have very poor food options. It tends to be mostly cigarettes, alcohol, and lottery tickets and candy bars. Um, but for some people, that may be the main <coughs> easy access uh, food that they have. Um, and then we'll talk more about the, the need for farmers to have more market opportunities. And also SNAP, which is our new term for, or newish for food stamps. Um, the, the stores need stores that are certified to be able to accept SNAP need to have some healthier options available. Then on the other side, we have foodies or millennials. Um, one of my students came up with the definition of foodie as socially responsible consumers with means. <laughs> so um, people who can spend a little bit more money on food and, and are looking for healthier options. So they want to know where their food comes from. They tend to prefer local. They want good tasting local food. Looking for convenience also. Um, eating more frozen food than they used to. Uh, that's become especially with the convenience push. Um, and there does seem to be an interest in supporting social missions. We found one blog that talked about aspirationals um, as a, another term for millennials, that they um, want to pay a little bit more if they feel like they're contributing to something good. So if you think about solutions to both of these things, um, we came up with this idea of good bowls as a way to combine that. And I'll say more about that. So, so it's a healthy meal product that's frozen. It's based on the Mediterranean diet. You've probably been reading about that. It seems to be coming up over and over with new studies that show that it's good in terms of heart disease. That was the initial thing. It, it seems to have some benefits in terms of cancer prevention dementia, uh, diabetes. So there are a number of ways that it appears that this is really looking like a strong um, approach to diet. So we've adapted it. We call it the Med South diet because we've adapted it to the southern kind of preferences. So you'll see we use a lot of sweet potatoes and greens and things like that. You don't have to be in the Mediterranean to eat it. 
So a reason to make it frozen is because the shelf life is a lot longer. We've done some projects trying to get fresh produce into, say, corner stores, and you know it goes bad in a few days. They tend not to have the equipment needed for it. A lot of people also don't cook anymore, um, so having a prepared meal can uh, work better. Uh, we, to the extent we can, we've used locally grown food, and we can, because again it's frozen, we can make big batches that are adapted to the seasons. So when I have what I've been calling the wintry mix, um, if you listen to the weather station, you know, they talk about a wintry mix. So, so this is a mix of things that are grown more in the winter, like the, the greens and sweet potatoes that, that last into the winter. We mentioned the cosmetically challenged food. Um, so we're doing this dual price point thing where we're subsidizing it in corner stores by selling it at a higher price in stores that cater to a higher income. And the nice thing is that all of the consumers get the same product. It's not like seconds that go to the corner store. It's the same product. So one question is, it, can we make it affordable? Um, have you heard of Tom's Shoes? The, that's where you buy a pair and they give a pair. And generally, this is called, some people call it BOGO, buy, buy one, give one. Um, so again, higher end consumers kind of subsidize it, it for the corner stores. This is just our little kind of mission statement here. But one, one criticism of Tom's shoes, it's actually getting better as I understand it, but um, if you donate something like shoes, and, and usually it's in developing countries, um, then you have to think about what happens to the local economy in terms of the people who make the shoes there. It's kind of like what happens with food aid sometimes if we give a boatload of grain to a community that's having some, you know, facing real um, challenges. It's good in terms of addressing the hunger problem, but it might undercut all of the farmers in the local area, which adds to the economic distress. So, um, and that <coughs> has been a problem in, with things like Tom's Shoes. So as you'll see, we're actually trying to work with local communities to kind of do distributed manufacturing so that they can actually produce the good bowls in, in a variety of different settings and that can create jobs makes it possible to use the local food and that sort of thing. So we have the social mission and I've taken some business school courses to try to figure out how to do that. So I've learned this terminology like the beachhead market, <laughs> which is where, where you make your money. <laughs> um, so here's a kind of maybe typical corner store that's kind of overrun with lots of stuff, most of which is not so healthy. And then the beachhead market we consider to be um, kind of the foodies and millennials. Notice they're all taking pictures of their food. I think millennials <laughs> like to do that. And, uh, and then just the busy uh, career person uh, who um, doesn't have a lot of time but wants to have healthier options for their family. So we're still playing around with the different pricing, but we're trying to aim for about $2.99. My dad was an economist and he always hated it when you use the 99, you know, he said, Alice, it's $3. Uh, but um, that's, we've learned that that's the way marketing works. So this was our failed attempt at pricing. This is in Weaver Street Market, if you know that in Chapel Hill. And we were trying to make it work so that in the same store, some people could pay less and some people could pay more. So we had these little coupons. <coughs> It says pay a little more, and it says kind of help somebody else out. And this one says pay a little less if you need a little help. We tried to phrase it in a way that didn't seem weird. Um, and so the flat price was $4.99, and then you could choose one of the coupons when you checked out, and then you could either pay more or less. Now, when we were in the store doing taste testing and telling people the story, almost everybody paid up because they thought it was a great idea. But if you think about it, if nobody's there telling you that, and it turns out the story was on the back of the box, <laughs> so you know, wouldn't you want to pay less if you had that option? So about half the people just ignored the coupons completely <laughs> and paid the $4.99, and then half of the remaining paid less. So that clearly didn't work with the business model. <laughs> so I think we're going to, sad but true, I think most shoppers at Weaver Street are more higher income because the prices are quite a bit higher and it's kind of a foodie kind of thing. Um, so I think we're gonna have to go with at certain stores we'll just charge more and then other places like corner stores will charge less. So um, just to kind of quickly show you, you see the different price points. 
Um, so, and we try, we're still working on what the cost of goods, or the COGS, as the business people say, um, to, to make this work. You see, at this point, we're actually losing money at the corner stores, but we <coughs> make a little bit of money at the higher-end stores. And then something that kind of surfaced as we were testing this is work sites. Um, I did some radio interviews early on. I think we got a little too much PR early on. <laughs> a lot of people did stories and we didn't have enough to, to keep up with it all. But someone, a doctor in the Family Medicine Center um, called me and said, Alice, we're in a food desert down here. And it turns out, if any of you know, the Family Medicine Center in Chapel Hill, it's kind of down the hill near the bypass and it's kind of in the woods. And it, it would be a long trek up to any sort of uh, food thing. And it's um, not big enough to have a cafeteria. So a lot of people live off the vending machines, which are mostly usual vending machines. So we've been experimenting a little bit with whether we can do some sort of a pay what you can type thing here. Um, and then since then, Duke has approached us because they want to do some sort of sliding scale thing for their employees. So the nice thing is that they don't, there's no retail markup. Um, usually these are, like actually a friend of mine who was a health director in Pitt County um, wanted to try this too because he was tired of his employees having to live out of vending machines. So that may be an option for us that works better than some of the other retail options. So another complicated slide here, but just showing kind of how the partnership works between UNC and Good Bowls. So We've been developing all the recipes, going through lots of stuff about food safety, uh, packaging. We're trying to test some environmentally friendly packaging like uh, compostable bowls, but they get dinged up in the freezer. And then you may have seen a story came out recently. I guess Chipotle is using some compostable containers, and there seems to be something leaching out of them. <laughs> so it's like you can't find oh, the initial bowls that we used. We thought we were doing well because it was recyclable but it was number one recyclable, which means it's, I learned later, has already been recycled once. And Orange County, where we're primarily based, doesn't recycle them again because it gums up everything. So, so it's a challenge to find a way to make this work. So the way we're trying to avoid the Tom's Shoes dilemma is that we've got this main processing facility in Hillsboro. And then the new grant that we just got will involve working in Warren County and, and another in Pender County, which is in Burgaw. And they both have food hubs and um, commercial kitchens in the same location, so they can aggregate the local food and cook it. So this is the key here. So this is what we have to balance for the business model, but the corner store where we'll sell at a lower price versus the higher-end retailer, so those numbers have to balance in some way. So um, at Warren County is a tier one county, very economically distressed, so we don't expect to have many high-end markets, although we're looking at Gaston Lake and people who take their boats up there. <laughs> that might be a market there. Um, in the Hillsborough area, clearly we have more of the higher-end stores. And then in Burgaw, not as many, although the food aggregation system, they take a lot of their local food down to Wilmington high-end restaurants, so there may be a way to also get Good Bowls in there. And then we have all these connections of how we work together to support these different efforts. Um, so this is the big commercial kitchen in Hillsboro where we're making the food now. When we did our pilot study, Weaver Street actually made the bowls for us, which was really a big help. Now we're learning the reality of how to make it ourselves. Um, so we, we had 2,400 bowls that we made and tested selling them in four higher-end stores. Weaver Street has um, three. Actually, the Raleigh store is opening on Saturday, in case anybody's interested in that. I'm on the board at Weaver Street, so I get all the messages. <laughs> They've been delayed multiple times, but it's finally going to open. And then this is a, <coughs> a corner store in the Warren County area, and we worked with a number of stores there. So in Warren County, I mentioned they have both a food aggregation system. They actually has a, have a vegetable chopping operation, too, where they chop um, produce in the, for the schools, although it's um, being upgraded right now, so it's out of commission. But then they took an old bank building downtown and made it into a kitchen. 
and then again, you saw the same store had a sign out front. If you ain't got it, you don't need it. <laughs> um, these are a, a map with some of the other corner stores. Let's see, did I? I think coming up, I've got a little video. Um, and then I'm also on the board of Feast Down East, which is a group down on the eastern part of the state that works a lot with supporting local farmers. And they have a, um, they took an old train station and they have a food aggregation center as well as a incubator kitchen. And they also work with housing authority um, uh, communities to deliver healthy food. So it has the food access part of it as well. So in terms of the customer response, yeah, this is our favorite thing, doesn't even taste healthy. Uh, we try to do what we call stealth health, which is to kind of slip in a lot of vegetables without people really recognizing them. And we put things over brown rice, which if it's covered with sauce and vegetables, you don't really notice too much. Um, we were doing a chili cook-off one time in Robinson County, and we had brown rice to serve the chili over, and we had a big pan of it. And a lot of people came up and said, what's this? Is it quinoa? <laughs> so people seem to have heard more about quinoa than they have brown rice. So, um, so again, they like the idea that it's the same product, um, support for the mission. Kind of the irony is that um, my understanding from working with lower income communities is that people who are going to buy a meal want to have some meat in it. So we put meat in all three of our first recipes. Of course, our higher end customers who are going to pay more money, they want vegetarian and vegan, or a lot of them, which is cheaper and easier to make, and it'll make us more money. <laughs> so we've added a, a vegan option to our, these are all the things that you learn. Um, and then people, uh, and especially in the corner store, said they wanted a family size option as well, which I think will be good nutritionally too as a way to involve the family. And they want to see good bowls back on the shelf. So this was another survey we did at um, Weaver Street. Everybody wants it to be healthy, local, social mission. We sort of joke, since I'm a Weaver Street shopper, I can make fun of myself that Weaver Street customers want to know if the chicken was happy when it died. You know, that's kind of <laughs> a bad level. Um, but we got some really nice comments back, and there's a little store in Carborough that offered to actually sell the bowls, so that was uh, fun to you. Um, so this is a, a little video in a corner store that we, the UNC actually did to kind of document this. So do I just, um, well, if I click on it, how does that work? Where's our IT guy? <laughs> Anybody know how to make this? Oh, up here. <coughs> that would probably work. Let's see if that works. It's cranky. Yeah. Uh, well, we might have to scroll down to. Oh, there it is. Is yeah. it somewhere after? Yeah. Bring this down a little bit. The Good Bowls program is a project to try to make sure everybody has access to healthy food, even if they have more money to come, and also to support the local economy through the local farmers and the ability to produce healthy products for sale within North Carolina. We work with Weaver Street Market in their food house to prepare to the extent that we can we use as much local food and then all of Weaver Street's parameters about grass-fed meats and things like that so that it's a really healthy product. I didn't quite realize that once I took Alice's class exactly how invested I would become in social entrepreneurship and it was more so this empowering idea of knowing that you could make a difference. So the first day I stepped foot in the class I understood that it was all about giving back to the community which is not something that I had first associated with entrepreneurship being right here. So what we're trying to accomplish here is that everybody has access to healthy foods. So we're charging more at some of the places like Weaver Street, Caracoa, and then at the corner stores, we are keeping the price lower so it can be more affordable. Having this dual price point, we're able to get both consumers the same food, which makes me feel really satisfied. We're not sure if that was a can of beer or a can of Coke. <laughs> Let's see. I, 
guess I just. Oh, okay. Yeah, I might mess it up anyways. Do you think if I. Yeah, maybe. There? Let's see. Oh, yeah. Oops. Is that it? Bringing. Thanks. That's where we were. Oops. <laughs> ah, Thank you. That makes sense. Text people down here. And then back to this screen work. Or that's oh, you're right. That's the mm -hmm. slide. And then now you're back. Okay. Now you can advance. Yay, team. Thank you. <laughs> um, why don't I stop for a second? Do people have questions so far? Or? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's a good idea. Um, <laughs> um, not at this point. Um, I am meeting with some people in Gastonia tomorrow who are a community group that's interested in looking at this more. But yeah, Johnson and Wales would be great to get more connections with them. Yeah. Yeah, we, we haven't done a lot on that since the pilot. So that's the next step that we want to do with this new grant of really see um, what the price point could be, what the market will bear, as they say, to see. Because, uh, I mean, we're fine with them. If they think they could sell it for more, um, that would be fine by us. We, we have to figure out ultimately some sort of, we're calling it a social franchise model, some way that we can have a relationship with the smaller stores that will allow us to keep going and support them, but also allow them to generate some income, which will not be easy to balance all of that, but did you? We do have the former dean of Johnson and Wales Culinary Program here on campus. Oh. We can hook you up. Oh. Did you hear that? Former Dean of Johnson & Wales on campus. Good to know. <laughs> Thanks. No, they're not on the shelves right now. We're, um, we're doing direct-to-consumer while we're tasting, testing all of our recipes and things still, which means that it, we can't sell at retail. To, in order to sell at retail, you have to have everything all lined up and all the nut nutrient analysis and everything. Um, because direct-to-consumer, it's, it's easier to trace back. As someone said, it's all about how many people you could kill. <laughs> so, um, so if it's retail where it could be some distance, although it seems like they're so good at tracking things these days, that wouldn't be that much of a problem. But um, I, I love to cook, and I developed or elaborated on most of these recipes, but um, I don't like to follow recipes. Um, so I actually had to have someone following me around in my kitchen with calipers, uh, measuring like how small I cut the green pepper and stuff like that, and, and weighing absolutely everything so that we could, you know, so that you can make it replicable. And so it takes a little bit of the fun out of it. I think initially when I started this, I was very naive and thought, well, we'll just use whatever food is, you know, the crops that are available at that time, and we'll just make up recipes. <laughs> so you can sort of do that with catering, but definitely not with the retail, because you have to have it all labeled very clearly. Any other questions? Okay. Um, so in terms of who benefits, hopefully there will be a benefit for the lower income families, the, what we started with in terms of people who don't have access to healthy food, um, the corner store retailers, um, and giving them more SNAP eligible options. There was a big move for a while um, at the federal level to um, increase the stocking requirements for being snack, SNAP eligible so you would have to carry a certain amount of healthier food options. That's kind of gotten derailed with all that's going on. Um, so, but if that were to come back into play, then something like this would help them out because they'd have more healthy options. Again, helping the small to mid-sized farmers. I mentioned the foodies. Um, 
a number of employers do offer options for their staff in terms of food available. Unfortunately, like at SAS, I don't know if SAS still does this, but when we used to send students there, they had M&M day where you could have as many M&Ms <laughs> as you wanted. Um, and then they had available soft drinks as much as you could drink. So usually kind of the benefits are, and I don't want to, SAS may have changed a lot since then, but and other companies too. But it usually, it, it, you know, the argument they make is that if you make food available, people can stay on campus. They don't need to leave. They're more productive. But it'd be better if they had healthier options. And then trying to reduce food waste is part of this. Lots of different partners that we're working with. Um, progress to date. So again, based on a lot of research of trying to make all of this work. Uh, looking at food insecurity, rural economic development, food waste. And we have the one-year pilot uh, from a foundation through UNC where we've been developing and testing lots of different things. I've mentioned most of that already. And now we have a new, um, it's called an STTR grant, Small Business Technology Transfer. It's a way of, more common if you know these kind of grants is SBIR, Small Business Innovation Research. It, the government, any of the big funders have to set aside like two or three percent of their budget for these grants. The idea being that it supports small business, which is less than 500 people, so it can be <laughs> fairly substantial. Um, but it allows you to kind of, the STTR combines a university and a business perspective. So it allows us to do more research to understand it more. And then, you know, just buying a good bowl every now and then is not going to revolutionize your diet. <laughs> so we're trying to think about other ways to um, make this work. Uh, one is to provide the recipes on our website. Now, my business school partner said, you're giving away your IP. <laughs> but if it were that easy, um, you know, nutritionists would be out of a job long ago. So my hope is that people will try it, decide that um, it's actually not so bad. Um, do many of you make roasted vegetables? That's a big basis for this. I, I think that's the solution to nutrition. <laughs> One thing, it fits really well with the Mediterranean diet because it involves the oil in addition to the vegetables, and then if you serve it over like a whole grain thing. So if people try it and see um, it's pretty good, and it's roasting vegetables is pretty easy, um, so we're hoping maybe we can kind of get people to do this at home as well. And then just providing more information and encouraging generally good health ideas. So we have excited partners. Just another quote there. I'm just going to skim through that. Whoops. Um, so some of the new market ideas that have been coming up as we've been testing it. So we mentioned the employers. Uh, Meals on Wheels would like to have things that they could offer to people over weekends or during disaster times, as long as the freezer doesn't <laughs> break. Um, we are actually experimenting with a healthier option at the Dean Dome <laughs> at UNC. Uh, my one group of students that took my public health entrepreneurship class the, actually, one of the women who took it was not a student, but she worked in the medical school, and she works in the renal unit, the kidney unit, and, and her, this is kind of a long story, but <laughs> makes sense. Um, one of the things that happens at the Dean Dome is the concession stands, um, they allow volunteers, like for various organizations, to sell. Uh, I did this with my kids when they were in preschool, uh, and then your organization gets some of the money. So by day, this woman was telling people not to drink Coke and eat too much salt. <laughs> and then by night, she was working at the Dean Dome selling all this stuff. So she felt really conflicted about that. So she got some students together. They've started a little company, and they have the Rams Nook, which is a little tiny um, concession stand. Um, they've mostly been selling the Mediterranean deli food, you know, just buying some and reselling that. But we tried Good Bowls one time, um, and it sold really well. So we're trying to work through all the um, hoops of food safety and all that sort of thing to see if we can do that again. Um, oh, and my dream is to, <laughs> with my, my three boys, they all played a lot of sports, and I sort of took on the concession for them up to the middle school, but then I kind of gave up at high school because it's kind of, <laughs> I sold a lot of really junky stuff when I volunteered. <laughs> but my dream is that you could do something like having sat in the cold bleachers for many football games, 
that you could order, have an app where you could order a good bowl uh, ahead of time, and then we could be heating them up <laughs> at the concession stand, because there's always a huge flood of people at halftime, and then you could just go and pick it up. And there you go. That may be a few years down the road. <laughs> um, actually, a lot of students are telling us that um, after 8 o'clock or so, it's hard to find anything very reasonable on campus, so it could be a, a campus option. And then this is <laughs> what I'm jokingly calling the military option. Uh, we actually are doing some work with Fort Bragg to see if we can um, improve the options there. So in entrepreneurship, you often talk about the itch and then finding the scratch to kind of take advantage of it, sort of the problem and then the solution. So it's been a problem for quite a while that the military is really concerned that one, many of their recruits are not eligible to be recruited because they're not fit. And obesity is a big part of that. Um, so you probably can't, well, you can read the Too Fat to Fight. So this was done by some retired generals. And then two years later, they did another one that says, still too fat to fight. And then um, just a week and a half ago, the New York Times came out with an article, Trouble for the Pentagon, the troops keep packing on the pounds. So um, we've learned from visits to Fort Bragg that it's just like any other community. Somehow I thought the military would have more control over the food that was available, but it's just lots of fast food and um, corner stores, and the base gets some revenue from the sale, so they're kind of reluctant to get rid of it. And then another thing, again, I'm always trying to solve three or four problems at one time. <laughs> the military spouses have a really hard time finding jobs. It turns out the, there's huge turnover, even at the higher levels, where people don't stay on base for more than two or three years. So that makes it really hard to find any sort of stable employment. So you may see where this is going. <laughs> so, trying to have healthier, convenient, good-tasting food on the base, and jobs. Often it's the women spouses. Um, so it could be something like what we're looking at some of these rural communities of if, they could, if the spouses could be involved with actually making the bowls and then make them available. And then a possible added benefit is that they could learn to cook healthier uh, for the families. That, you know, in addition to the cost to the military of the recruits, there's all the dependents and all of their chronic health problems over time. So that all adds up to be very costly. So students really like this project. <laughs> so I'm always looking for ways to involve them. Um, two of my former students started their own company they called Food Insight Group, and they helped with some of the early recipes. And then we've had several business school classes. We had a computer science class, sustainability consulting, a marketing class. A um, bunch of students signed up during the orientation and then summer internship. So it's a nice way if we can figure out how to um, put them all to work. Um, we actually are looking into the students volunteering and possibly others in the community who want to volunteer to actually help do the cooking. Um, which we've tested a little bit and it seems to work well and we can work out the food safety stuff, but now I'm learning that there's some labor laws about um, <laughs> um, using, if anybody's an expert in that, let me know, but um, that for a for-profit company to have volunteers that there's a problem with that. I don't know if we can, there's a new law clinic at UNC that's supposed to help startups, so I've consulted with them, but they're I've learned that the word opinion to a lawyer is very different from <laughs> so They're not well, willing to give me an opinion in the formal sense. But So we're going to try to find out if there's a way to have unpaid internships or something, because it could certainly involve a learning experience. I think yes. the law is you can't have someone volunteer to do a job that you pay someone to do in another circumstance. So what if you don't have enough money to pay people? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have to work around that somehow. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so very new development. Um, there's a group in, um, I think I have it on the next slide, I can never, oh no, it's right here, Green Rural Redevelopment Organization in Henderson in Vance County. We teamed up with them 
and wrote for a funding opportunity called Game Changers. This, this group, the Winrock Wallace Center, does a lot of food systems kind of work, and so we've been named a Game Changer group. So we're gonna go to New Orleans and get some help from their design thinking people and others. And they've actually, kind of a sad thing, but opportunity here, I guess in a lot of rural, small towns, there's such an exodus of people to more urban areas that a lot of the schools are closing down because they, they don't have enough population to, to use them all. So there's a really beautiful middle school that's being closed down. Some of it's being turned into social services offices and things, but it has a really good kitchen. So we're gonna look at whether we could use that as one of these kind of satellite kitchens. So this, these are the partners there. So these are some of their aims, which are very good fit with what we're doing. And they do some urban in the sense of small scale town agriculture. So challenges ahead. So we're still gearing up production in this facility that's not Weaver Street. One thing we learned that if you use meat in addition to the fact that not everybody wants meat, um, it's a, a much bigger food safety hurdle. You have to have a USDA inspector on site. So when we did it at Weaver Street, they had somebody there already, so that was easy. Um, where we're making the PFAT, they've done things like popsicles and kombucha and things like that. They've never done a product that has meat. So it's fine, it's easy if you're doing direct-to-consumer catering, but if you're doing, again, the frozen product, you have to go through more hoops to make that work. So we're trying to figure out all of that. Um, so just you know, getting the grants and the funding to launch all of this, um, finding the right price point that we talked about, how we're gonna do the distribution to the corner stores. We're finding a lot of people who work with low-income communities who would help us distribute. So I'm not sure that corner stores are gonna work out to be the best place. It's also very different from so much else that they sell there. So we're keeping the door open on that, but also trying to figure out some other options. Um, and then, you know, a lot of, I don't know, maybe some of you know a term for this. You know the term greenwashing, where you make things look like they're environmentally um, better, but they aren't. <laughs> so unfortunately, I see a fair amount of this in social ventures where, like I saw one where you could, it was a mail order food thing, but the products were very high end, and you had to pay a fee to start um, you know, to become a member, kind of like Costco, and then you could order. So, and they, the big advertising was that, you know, if for every membership we get, we give a membership to a low-income person, which sounds great, but I kept asking them, they had talked to me about maybe evaluating things, and I kept asking them, how many people take you up on that membership? And, um, you know, because the product prices are pretty high, I think very few low-income people would ever even operationalize their membership. So, so they wouldn't even have to pay the money for it because you don't pay. So that's kind of a greenwashing equivalent on this. So, and, but it's hard, you know, it's really hard to make all the price points work and to keep it going and, you know, to buy local food is more costly because you have a bunch of small farmers bringing stuff. You can't just order everything you need in one batch. So to make it all work and stick with everything we're trying to do will be a challenge. And that's it. <clears throat> so I'm happy to take questions. <laughs> Grab my water. So any advice for me? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I've incorporated as a company a, a little over a year ago, but the process of thinking it through has probably been five or ten years <laughs> of kind of all the different projects. Like we've done. Um, food prescription type programs where you, um, we didn't, I mean, we worked with a family medicine clinic and the doctors would refer them and then we had a CSA type model, community supported agriculture, where we had nutrition classes and then we worked with the farmer to bring a box of produce in every week that we had the class. So they went home with produce and the class, but um, they had to come at the right time to get it and uh, transportation was often a problem. People weren't familiar with what was in the box, so cooking it was a problem. So, um, all so many different things we've tried. They worked to some extent, but there was always some kind of challenge. So it's kind of, kind of triangulated in on this idea, which may not work either. But <laughs> we're giving it a try. Yeah. Uh, 
seems like the keto diet's getting pretty popular now. How close is that to a Mediterranean diet? I'm assuming it's pretty close, except for more protein. There's some similarities for sure. That probably the main thing is the higher fat content, uh, which you know, for so many years we preached low fat, which was really a bad thing. <laughs> um, so, um, and there's a lot of good things about high quality fat in terms of your appetite. You know, you tend to um, have less of a spike in appetite than you would with very simple carbohydrate foods. It's not nearly as um, restricted as keto because, you know, a lot of the vegetables are carbohydrates, but if you have a lot of um, oil on them. The My husband and I collaborate a lot. He's a general internist and uh, epidemiologist, and so we uh, we're actually doing a study now, uh, an NIH study on using the Mediterranean diet for weight loss. And one of the big things we think is the appetite control. Like, I don't, I wouldn't enjoy this myself, but my husband eats a spoon of peanut butter in the morning for his breakfast. <laughs> and, you know, the nuts are one of the, in, in terms of the Mediterranean diet, that's one of the study arms that did really well, that and olive oil. So nuts are a really good option. I would prefer a handful of nuts instead of a spoon of peanut butter. Um, but it really does make a difference on your appetite. Uh, you don't tend to be hungry so much later on as if you, say, ate a bagel with jam or something like that, that or cereal. Whatever. You use machinery for processed fruits and vegetables, and because you need phthalogens with their yeast and fibers. Ah. We haven't found a lot of machinery that will chop things like that. I think there are some. Um, I think some of the people at the farmer's market use, like you can chop sweet potatoes. And the, that group in Warren County, they, they, actually, they have a chopper for greens. Um, I don't know what the misshapen, are, are you familiar with choppers? Do you know? No, not yeah. at all. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that could happen. We might have to do a little hand chopping first to put it in. Or, yeah, the technology is something we definitely need to explore more in terms of, because hand chopping vegetables, although then we can claim, <laughs> I always laugh at the hand cut avocado. It seems like, <laughs> you know, all the, the avocado toast and things like that, and people always say hand cut avocado. <laughs> <laughs> think, what else would cut an avocado? But um, maybe that could be one of our advertising <laughs> things, you know. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned, um, and I agree with you all, the roasted, sort of wintry vegetables, because they're mm. simple so often. Are you formulating meals with more summertime fruits? Um, we are. I mean, we haven't really gotten far enough to say this is a summer meal and this is a winter, but um, you know things like summer squash and zucchini, which are very abundant at certain times of the year, but they also don't keep very long, like like a sweet potato or cabbage or something like that. So those are some things to think about. But we do we have a curry recipe where we use a fair amount of the summer squash. Kind of thing. Yeah. Well, we're testing in areas that have a racial mix. So like the Durham County Health Department, we have a lot of staff who graduated from our program. <laughs> so it's a good connection. So we've tried, and I think quite a few staff as well as patients are uh, a variety of uh, racial ethnic uh, backgrounds. So um, we are trying to make sure that we test broadly like that. Um, my experience is the Southern diet kind of crosses a lot of racial lines that the kind of green sweet potato stuff, it's not um, super unique to one group. I'd like to I've talked some with, um, we've done some work in Robinson County with the Lumbee Indian. I've been trying to find some kind of culturally relevant foods there. One of the main things is a collard sandwich, if anybody's heard of that. It's, uh, except that it has a big slab of fat back on it. <laughs> so um, it's thin cornbread and then collards, but then there's a um, slab of fat back. So um, 
and then I talked to someone else who was really interested in this, but he was coming up with all these ancient grains, things that you know probably were used, but would be hugely expensive to be able to do this. So trying to find what the right mix is is challenging. But I would love to do regional kinds of foods. Yeah. What is the, the shelf life of the meal from the food when they have to eat it? And how do you freeze it to ensure that the nutrients stay within the food? Because when, mm. when you cook, you freeze and then you repeat, that loses the nutrient content. It does some in terms of the nutrient loss, although you know the biggest problem we have in this country is not so much vitamin C and things like that. It's really much more of the excesses of um, the sugars and the refined carbohydrates and stuff like that. So most people aren't you know at risk of a deficit when it comes to vitamins. So um, and if you like, when people ask me if local food is healthier, I tell them, well, if you keep your broccoli that you got from the farmer's market in your crisper for two weeks, as opposed to California, you know, broccoli that's harvested and frozen immediately, you probably have more nutrient loss in your crisper. <laughs> so a lot of it's how it's kind of processed and that kind of thing. In terms of the shelf life, um, I listened to a story on NPR once that was a, interviewing frozen food experts, and they basically said that there's no and to how long it can last <laughs> uh, in terms of food safety. Um, of course, the freezer burn, you know, over time, it's not going to taste as good. But it, we, like Weaver Street, just made up a date when we did the pilot, and we chose four months. And the quality seemed to be fine after that. I think it could have been longer. So does that cover your question? Yes, you had yeah, a couple. In. Um, for Weaver Street, we didn't have a flash freezer. We just did regular freezing, and it wasn't bad. But all the experts tell you it needs to be flash frozen. So where we're doing it now does have a flash freezer. So you, apparently the faster you freeze it, the less likely you have crystals, ice crystals and things, which is where you get the mushiness when it thaws out. So yes, I've been talking freezer technology with people. <laughs> so, um, so we don't have the latest and greatest at the place we're doing it now, but at least we have a blast freezer. Mm. In the pilot program, it seems like it's kind of the two polar opposites. You had convenience stores in rural areas and mm. the boutique grocery store mm -hmm. in the Durham area. And what about food I line? Think <laughs> the impact of that is yeah. how that goes. Have you mm -hmm. had any communication with our regional large grocery store chains that have the distribution and infrastructure and all in place? If they seem mm -hmm. to be trying to move more to using yeah, local, yeah, local products? Mm hmm. It's a really good question, and a lot of people keep telling us we should look at dollar, uh, dollar general dollar. There's several different dollar stores that tend to be penetrating lower income communities. We're not kind of established enough yet to do that, and it'll be interesting because I think you're right. There is an interest in healthier options, but then the retailers, the, there are a lot of hurdles. Like you have to, what's the stocking? fees, you have to pay a certain amount, and do, do you know this world, you may be able to, no. <laughs> you have to pay just to have your food on the shelf, and then depending on where it is on the shelf, you may have to pay more, and all these other things that really start adding up. So we've, has anybody heard of Seal the Seasons? It's a, um, another small company that came out of UNC, very successful, they, it's mostly taking frozen, for the most part, fruit. Uh, it's essentially local frozen, frozen local fruit. Um, and they've been coaching us. Actually, the, it's a young guy who uh, ran with it, but his initial founding partner took my class, so I claim a little bit of <laughs> connection with that. But now he's coaching us. Um, but uh, they've had a lot of challenges with you know the price always getting jacked up with all these retailer fees and things like that. We're we're beginning to wonder, although we're sorting all this out, if we should stick with the stores that kind of have more of a similar mission, like the co-ops, Whole Foods. We've talked to them. They they said it fills a gap for them. I think in terms of convenient, and they, they like the local part of it. Um, but we might need to go with stores that are willing to recognize the mission and maybe give us a break on some of the stocking fees and things like that to make it viable. Has anybody come to you like that, just like Whole Foods? Or, or um, no. 
I'm not sure that we're out there enough for that to happen, but that'd be interesting. I have a colleague actually in at UNC Charlotte who does a lot of work with the dollar stores, and she thought they would be interested. I think they're under a fair amount of pressure to have some healthier options there. So, try that. Mm -hmm. Is the difference the local food aspect of it? Um, would, we, mm -hmm. would we achieve the same results by just trying to get corn stores to sell Amy's? Or uh, is it, yeah, if you could help me understand that a little bit. Better. Yeah. The, the local part is. Amy's, but, you know, sort right, of right. And they are definitely one of our competitors. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't, I sort of doubt they'd be willing to sell at a lower price in corner stores, but. Maybe. Um, you know, that's their model is really more higher end kind of thing. I mean, a lot of their stuff also doesn't have a lot of vegetables. Maybe some of it does. I'm, I guess I'm thinking of the mac and cheese and those things that, that, that are organic, I guess, but not necessarily um, packed with um, nutrient sorts of things. Um, so, the, and, oh, and then ultimately, if we can pull off this distributed manufacturing kind of franchise thing, that would be very different. Um, that's probably different from anybody. <laughs> probably the hardest thing to do, but um, our dream to make that happen. Did I answer your first question about the processes of things? Or? Well, I think it, it seems like it's sort of in the works. Yeah, a lot of it's still. Dis distributed. distributed manufacturing, that's a term that's sometimes used. We took a business school class and we had to pitch to um, venture capitalists, which we weren't thinking we were necessarily thinking of, but now maybe. Uh, there are some they call impact investors who you know want to see more things happen. And one guy was very interested in that idea as a way of scaling up. Apparently in Great Britain they do that a fair amount of this where instead of just doing everything in one big warehouse or production facility, they try to do it by distributing the manufacturing in other places. And it does give, you know, especially with all the challenges we have in rural areas with jobs and economic development and stuff, if, if we can pull that off, it will, I think, really offer a nice opportunity for that, which you wouldn't see in other manufacturing ways. So. But I've learned that Franchises is a very legal kind of thing. It may be more like licensing, because um, I guess, I mean, it's intended to protect the franchisees, but um, maybe to the point that it wouldn't function for us. So we, we have to figure out some way to, to make that work. It looks like maybe we're ending our time. Or, oh. to actually get it on the shelves. That's what everybody wants to know. Well, our, I guess we're kind of a loosey-goosey company. Our COO um, just got back today from a month in the wilderness leading a, a group of social entrepreneurs, actually. It's a fellowship program. Um, and so she was, the, she was totally off the grid for a month in Idaho. So we've been kind of waiting for her to get back to <laughs> jump back in. So hopefully in a couple of months, but we've said that before, so we'll see. <laughs> oh, yeah. Any sense of whether or not this can be a decision game changer for folks who are hooked on fast food, on burgers, mm. and tacos, and things like that? Any sense of that? Well, you have to do a lot of taste testing. And um, like we had some folks from Fort Bragg come up the other day, and we, we want to go on base, because this was not the, uh, the lower ranking folks. But um, I think they were surprised when they tasted it. And that, that, that's like the comment, it doesn't even taste healthy. You know, I think we're going to have to do a lot of marketing and testing to be able to convince people of that. But, you know, I think most of us are reluctant to try anything new until we've tasted it. And if they see that it's actually not so bad, that we may be able to start shifting that. But it's not an easy road, for sure. I'm happy to hang around afterwards, too, if people have questions. Well, let's do so. that. Let mm. me um, say thank you on behalf sure. of all of us. Thank mm. you so much for coming. <laughs> 
Oh, yes. <laughs>